Teachers College presents Taking the Election to School, Making Education a Focus of the 2012 Election, a debate between John Schnur, Education Advisor to the Obama Presidential Campaign, and Phil Handy, Education Advisor to Republican nominee Mitt Romney. Live webcast brought to you by Education Week with support from the International Reading Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Susan Furman, president of Teachers College. Good evening, everyone. I'm Susan Furman, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Taking the Election to School, a debate between education advisors to the two major party presidential candidates. In addition to our live audience here tonight, I want to extend greetings to those of you who are watching the live webcast of this debate at home on the Education Week website, and to thank Education Week and the International Reading Association for its sponsorship, and those joining us from the National Press Club in Washington, DC. We're absolutely delighted to be hosting this event here at Teachers College, and we have to thank our dear alumna and friend and member of my Presidential Advisory Committee, Phyllis Kossoff, who is sponsoring this lecture tonight. Phyllis, would you stand up? <laughs> Education should be a central issue in national elections, and for good reason. Everyone agrees it's among the most important, if not the most important factor, in ensuring our country's future, in its own right to produce educated citizens, but also as education addresses economic challenges, national security, global relationships, the environment, and virtually every major issue that faces us. Few are more familiar with these concerns than our two speakers tonight. Phil Handy is a former chairman of the Florida State Board of Education and the higher education co-chair of Governor Romney's Education Policy Advisory Group. He also co-chairs Governor Romney's Florida presidential campaign and is co-chairman of the National Policy Council on Education for the governor. Mr. Handy was a member of the Board of Overseers of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and currently serves as an advisor to the Program on Educational Policy and Governance at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and as director of Stand for Children. He was state chairman of Jeb Bush's gubernatorial campaigns in Florida in the 90s and co-chairman of the 2002 gubernatorial campaign. John Schnur is participating in his capacity as advisor to the Obama presidential campaign. John is the co-founder and executive chairman of America Achieves, a nonprofit organization helping communities and states leverage leadership policy and practice to build high quality educational systems. He also advises philanthropists seeking to improve education, including Bloomberg Philanthropies. In 2000, John co-founded New Leaders for New Schools and served as its CEO until last year. When he took a leave of absence, he took a leave of absence from that post in 2008 and 2009 to join the Obama for America presidential campaign, and he was a senior advisor to President Obama's transition team and to U.S. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan. In the 1990s, he served as President Clinton's White House Associate Director for Educational Policy and was also a special advisor and assistant in the Department of Education. I am told that these two have debated each other before and are old hands at, um, at uh, this sort of debate, but we do have a format here. Um, I'm gonna begin by asking each of our speakers a question individually, one that they chose that is intended to allow us all to become familiar with the basic ideas about education that are embraced by the respective campaigns. I will then ask several questions to both candidates that aim at providing a comprehensive and deeper perspective on their candidates' views on a range of educational issues. I may draw on questions pre-submitted by our Washington, D.C. alumni from the National Press Club, our faculty, and the TC community here in the audience this evening. Thank you for those suggestions. I'll conclude with a question from the Education Week audience and an opportunity for each speaker to provide closing statements. 
Each speaker will have up to four minutes to respond to each question, but we hope they'll be succinct so we can cover more topics. I will ask uh, follow-up questions as they occur, and I will also see if each of you wants to respond to something um, the other said. Following the debate, the audience members are invited to remain with us for a panel discussion moderated by Mark Bomster, a national editor for Education Week, and including our faculty member, Jeffrey Hennig, Education Week reporter, Allison Klein, and Liz Willen of our own Heckinger Institute. I'm also going to ask everybody to behave well. <laughs> no interruptions or outbursts. And please remember that this event is being webcast live, webcast live which means keeping relatively still and quiet. So let me start alphabetically with Phil Handy uh, with the question that you wanted to be posed first. The federal government's contribution to K-12 funding in the United States is about 10%, while state and local governments fund the remainder. Given this fact, what role would the federal government play in a Romney administration? What role would the uh, federal government play in education in the Romney administration? Right. Uh, and there's, there's a long, certainly, history of uh, the federal government's involvement, starting with land-grant colleges uh, 220 years ago. And um, <clears throat> there is a role for federal government, so any discussion about eliminating the Department of Education or um, some, somehow eliminating the federal role is probably uh, not well-founded, at least as it relates to our candidacy. But uh, I think there's uh, basically two roles for the federal government. One is the, um, the role of transparency and, and telling the truth. I found that uh, when I was the State Board of uh, Education chairman in Florida that um, American public education is uh, uh, hindered significantly by the inability sometimes to tell the truth. It uh, goes with the political process since politicians generally last a short period of time and the child's education lasts a long period of time. So. The federal government is, uh, I think, uh, uh, mandated with the responsibility for transparency and for the, the collection of data, honest data, and uh, transparent data that empowers the consumer, the parent, the child, educators, leaders in their decisions about, about, federal ed about public education. And, and secondly, I think it's to create an environment uh, that allows a, a freer um, ability for choice um, in uh, public education. So to do away with, uh, if you will, the constraints or the, uh, the issues that, can, that constrain uh, uh, parents' ability to choose, to uh, empower the monopoly, um, it's an attempt to try to uh, <clears throat> level the playing field, if you will, to, to provide a, a greater empowerment for parents and kids. And I think there's a hundred or thousands of uh, policy issues that go inside that, but fundamentally is to tell the truth, to help states and districts and schools to tell the truth, and it's to empower competition and give parents the choice. No, we believe that no child should be obligated to go to school just because they were born in a certain zip code, and uh, that's the essence of choice for us. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, John the opening question, but maybe we'll follow up to that question after. Uh, John, you've <clears throat> advised President Obama since he was a U.S. Senator. What have been his core beliefs and views about education over the years, and how does the Obama administration's work reflect those? Yeah. Thank you, Susan, and it's uh, great to be here with you and, and Phil. Um, while we may have uh, uh, disagreements and our candidates have may have some strong disagreements on issues like education, Phil is a wonderful person and leader, so it's great to be here with you, Phil. Thanks, John. Um, so, uh, President Obama, uh, sometimes as a president, you get known for your policies. And I, want, I think policies are important. But policies are grounded in core beliefs and experiences. And I have, over the years, had a chance to sort of witness him from early in his time as a US senator make decisions about education that are essentially grounded in a certain core beliefs that continue today. Number one, every interaction I've ever seen with him, he is very, very focused on how do we do much better by all our kids in the country in education, particularly those who are low income and underserved. He has been, always been very aware and dissatisfied with where we've been in education, even while knowing that, he, as he said uh, many times, that he and Michelle Obama became who they were because of education in this country. They know it's a core value that has made possible the American dream in a real way, 
But we've shortchanged that, he's aware, because of his dissatisfaction. The story I'll tell briefly, I think, highlights, I think, where he comes from on education across his policies is in early January of 2009. Um, Phil and I had debated a number of times in 2008. The president had won re-election. Um, education hadn't been a big topic in the campaign, although he continued to bring it up, including in many of the debates. Uh, as you know, in early January, we had just lost uh, over a million and a half jobs in two months. Uh, the um, economists had just declared that we'd gone into a recession that had started a year before, and it appeared to many that we potentially could be headed toward a Great Depression. The president, as in the transition, was working on an uh, economic recovery plan um, to avert depression that was mostly focused, needed to be focused on how to avert this short-term economic crisis. I had a meeting with him in early January on education for an hour in his transition offices when he was very clear that there was no economic stimulus plan that could be passed without a fundamental investment in the long-term drivers of our success in the country and economy, including a massive focus on education. At that moment, in the stimulus, no one was talking about a large investment in education as part of the stimulus bill. No one was focused on reform in a serious way. And coming out of that meeting, he articulated some core principles that essentially guided his team to put together a package for him that wound up investing $100 billion out of the $800 billion economic recovery package in education, including that averted layoffs and, uh, for over 400,000 teachers. It expanded funding for Head Start. It expanded funding for Pell. And it also coupled those investments in protection of job loss in education, just the time our kids didn't need more teachers to be cut off, our kids didn't need to be cut off from Pell or Head Start, with reform agenda. And he insisted that as part of that, that the package include what became the Race to the Top, the Invest in Innovation Fund, and reforms that eventually helped 46 states adopt higher standards, um, and now are putting in place assessments to match that in an effort to make better use of existing funds. And to, to watch, for me, to watch him in that moment, when the, you know, the responsibility of averting a depression was on his soldiers, shoulders, and he insisted that a package could only be passed with that large of an investment in education, and those investments in access to education and reforms, to me, was a reflection of the man I had gotten to know over the years, and as I'll get into tonight, underlie all of his policies, from early learning to K-12 through education to post-secondary. He knows it's key to access the American dream. He knows it's key to driver economic competitiveness, and we can't let arguments whether budget policy or federalism or anything else keep the nation, national government play a supportive role of state and local governments to ensure that kids get the education they need and deserve. Thanks for those openings, and we're now going to get into some details. Let's start with the Common Core standards. 45 states have adopted Common Core standards. President Obama has supported federal, the federal government's role in implementing the standards, but Governor Romney says he opposes using federal funds to support the Common Core. Could you elaborate a bit more about each candidate's position on the Common Core standards? And this time we'll start with you, John. So yes, on the Common Core, the, um, as, as many people in the audience know, there's been an effort from uh, states across the country, governors and state superintendents of education, to essentially replace uh, a lot of the watered down current academic standards in the country and a lot of the pretty mediocre fill in the bubble multiple, multiple choice tests with a much more rigorous set of standards that reflect true readiness for success in college and careers. And that effort's come along with support, bipartisan support. Uh, now um, 46 states have adopted the, the standards and uh, uh, the uh, uh, while standards alone don't drive improvement in education, you also need the investments and supports for kids and teachers to reach those. They really are key when our, we've been really kind of uh, set our bar low in education. And in a way, and Phil talked about the importance of speaking about truth in American education or in, any, in anything. Um, in education to this day, in a way, the low standards that we've set for our kids and the fill in the bubble multiple choice test that reflect this kind of low level of standard and are deciding what, how our kids or schools are doing based on that kind of standard and test has led us to be lying to our kids. That kids are told around the country that they're proficient on a mediocre test and that that's success. But in fact, they aren't ready for success, and we know it from the data, in college and careers. So the question is how do we have a much more rigorous standard? So the president was clear this is a perfect example of his philosophy about the federal role in education, at least one of them, is that when there's state efforts to move an important innovation, in this case, higher standards, he, the president really wanted to see that he could support that, and so incented the adoption of those standards and raised the top, and actually provided, um, knowing that standards would not be meaningful without much better assessments to replace the current assessments, um, set aside over $400 million of, the, of stimulus funding in order to support 
willing states to design the new common core of assessments that will be ready in the next couple of years to ensure that we really have assessments that measure what we care about our kids knowing rigorous reading, rigorous math, critical thinking skills, problem solving skills. And he thinks the state should determine those standards, but the federal government can play a supportive role in helping to finance making that happen. What is the support beyond the initial support that is uh, projected for the common core? So uh, again, this, uh, out of the first stimulus funding, uh, there was no one on any side who had sort of thought, hey, maybe we could use some of this funding to improve our long-term economy by funding the creation of the assessments. So we put aside the $400 million for the assessments. And then once the assessments are in place, and there are two consortia of states, as many people know, who are going to set the standards, decide on the assessments, it really leads to then what is your philosophy on the federal role is. And I must say on this front, transparency and choice, I think, are in fact representative of a lot of the philosophy the Romney campaign has. I think the president views that you need um, deep investments in the supports for kids and for teachers to support those. You need more funding in education um, in a way to finance especially the low-income kids in schools who, without federal funding, um, wouldn't have a ch shot at this. There's ten, dollars, ten cents of every dollar goes to every, ten cents of every education dollar comes from the federal government. But in high poverty schools, Title I schools, I've been in schools where 40 cents and the dollar comes. So the philosophy is let's invest in those, let's invest in equity, let's invest in teacher professional development, let's invest in preparing kids to be successful through early learning, to be ready to do well on those standards, and that provides a cornerstone of a second term agenda. Okay, Phil, uh, the Common Core, no federal funds to support the Common Core. Do you want to pick up on that? The, the Common Core has started uh, in the National Governors Association and uh, 46 governors willingly opted in to adopt the new standards, which are a very good idea. Standards make a lot of sense when put together with assessments, and we'll talk a little bit about assessments. Very simply put, it's, from our standpoint, it's an opt-in program. It's a governor-led program, and it should be opted in. I hope we'll have a chance to talk about these waivers that have been given in response to No Child Left Behind, and. Uh, the incentives that have been uh, used to uh, try to drive Common Core and drive assessment packages. Uh, um, I think we'll have uh, some disagreement about that. But the Common Core should be opted in by governors, enacted by the states if they want to. So far, 46 have. For, it's part of the law of 46 different states, and it, it feels like it has plenty of momentum uh, to move forward. The assessment packages, <coughs> uh, but both of them are, uh, you know, should, should ultimately be sponsored by the states. There's an equally divided now. I think there's 23 states have, have adopted each one. I think at the end of the day, we'll end up with one assessment package uh, that makes sense, but it will be opted in by the, by the governors who, uh, who would, and state boards and state legislatures who adopt them. So let's pick up then on your statement about talking more about testing and assessment. Uh, and could you state the position on that, but also wrap it into the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, or No Child Left Behind. Well, I'd say initially, uh, John and I, uh, I'm glad to be back on the stage with John. I always enjoy being with John. And thank you for uh, tonight's debate, by the way. Thank you very much for Teachers College. Um, uh, I, I, would, um, I would say that um, uh, Using federal funds for uh, assessment and uh, and curriculum is a state responsibility, not not a federal responsibility. Federal responsibility is to uh, make sure the data is right and the data is correct. But I, I don't think uh, the federal government should uh, be involved in that. Uh, we, as the Romney administration uh, or the Romney campaign, would not be able to create the kind of funding. Uh, that the Obama administration has done for race to the top, for stimulus, for all kinds of activities which have added to the deficit. We're not proposing more money for public education. We're not proposing any cuts either, but we're not proposing more money for education. So we're always going to lose on the subject of creating uh, economic incentives, um, which we don't think are the purview, frankly, of the federal government. So I just have to, before I ask you on testing, I have to follow up on we're not proposing to cut. I think that came as a little bit of a surprise uh, in the first debate, given that the Ryan budget would cut discretionary spending by 
you know, billions, <laughs> uh, billions of billions, uh, enough so that you wonder how you could not cut education in that uh, scenario. Look, the, um, the attack on the deficits is all wrapped up in entitlements that's certainly not on the periphery with public education or roads or prisons. It's a very, very, very small part of the budget. So 52 or 53% of the budget going to 75 are all wrapped up in, in entitlements. You can easily uh, hold public education harmless without impacting uh, uh, the creation of more deficits, which we're opposed to. Could you agree, John? So I think um, we have a disagreement here that um, there needs, there's agreement, I think, in the country and should be, that we need to be responsible about bringing down the debt and deficit, and that's very important. Within that, I think the question is, what do you see as a need for a cut or increase, and what do you see as an investment? I think a difference of philosophy, in my view, in this is that the president sees education as an investment in our future. And I think it's seen the way it's described as an education is an expense that's got to be capped in, 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 in Romney and Republican circles. And the president believes that we have to have modest increases, and his track record has demonstrated increases in education that, by the way, have led to now 10, 10 million um, young people are benefiting from Pell grants. We've had, um, we got from 6 million before, before we started. Um, millions of kids are benefiting from um, Head Start. Um, so the question about the budget is a question of priorities and values, and I think that the Romney campaign on education is imprisoned by the Romney's uh, budget policy. There's been estimates that have shown that in order for Romney to, the Governor Romney to increase funding for defense in the way he's described, and protect Social Security, and protect the various areas that he said need to be protected, when you look at the amount of discretionary funding, other than defense, that over, this, over the years, over several years, that over 50% of that fund, those funds would need to be cut from somewhere. Um, now, until last week, it had been assumed that there would be, in some cases, there's been, he's used the, the description of across the board cuts um, to take effect the first year. I was pleased that the governor said there'd be no cuts in education, but there's no way the math holds up that you can protect education when you've got to cut non-defense discretionary funds by more than 50%. And if you did, you'd have to have even larger cuts to things like school breakfast and school lunch programs and to um, veterans health care programs. And so for me, the math doesn't hold up in the Romney budget, which means that when we get to a uh, real presidency, the question is, is where are the candidates' priorities? And that's what they're going to fight for. And basically, I've seen again and again and again the president has stood up for both reform but also funding in education. I think the governor, good man, has said that there ought to be a smaller department of education, ought to be consolidated with other departments or shrunk a lot. He said money doesn't matter a lot in education. And so I think that Phil's described this. There's not a priority for growing the money to create incentives. And so I think you would see a dramatically different investment in education if you see a President Obama compared to if you see a President Romney. I, I just uh, you, comment that... Um, I was going to ask. John's characterization of investments is probably not exactly right. The stimulus package is two years of funding. I wouldn't call that a long-term investment in education. We've saved between 160 and, John would say, 400,000 jobs, but we're about to go off the cliff. The $100 billion is done, and uh, we're back to where we began. Race to the top is the same way. It's short-term money, basically. None of the states who got raised to the top money have complied with the, all the criteria that went with the money. It's not long-term investment. And so uh, I would say you can't have it both ways. You can't put a lot more money into it on a short-term basis and call it an investment. It, it's just not. But the president, I mean, the, the budgets have continued to reflect you know, modest increases, responsible but modest mm -hmm. increases over the years. And I would just say that that investment, even the stimulus, which was the first part of his presidency, has produced enduring changes. You have people who are Democratic and Republican governors across the country who say that this has been more a period of greater change and focus on improving education in the last few years than they've seen for, for decades. And that's in part because of a strategic use of funding that, by the way, is, is, it was a reflection of an idea of incentives for people to do the right things on things like reform, which does, you have to ask about NCLB reauthorization, it does reflect a move away from, I think under No Child Behind, there was a, um, some good ideas, and including shining a spotlight on, um, on achievement gaps for low-income kids and kids of color, and I think there was some good that was done by parts of No Child Left Behind. The fundamental flaw, I think, has proved to be that it's a, 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 a one-size-fits-all mandate on the country, um, and I think we have to be very careful about what we mandate um, and I think the president's moved through his incentive programs and race the top 
uh, and through the waiver process to incentivize states to do right things, to give them flexibility from one size fits all mandates. And I think that the approach of modest investments over the long term with the burst of investments that was a small portion of the overall stimulus in education combined with more flexibility, moving away from more of the one size fits all mandates, I think is the right blend for the national education. Okay, just ask you just to nail this down. So if the ESEA got reauthorized, the president's proposal would look a lot like the waivers that he's giving now, but so any the, significant differences? So the president's basically prioritized that. The, the, the most important thing that the president and the Obama administration have said need to be constant, which have not been constant in the, over the last decade or beyond, is that every state ought to have standards and expectations and assessments that reflect those, that reflect real rigor and true readiness for college and careers. And so there have been, in the, in the uh, administration's ESEA proposal, there have been um, proposals not to incent the common core specifically. This is an important difference. There's not been a proposal to incent the adoption of the common core standards. There's, but, but there's a requirement that states have re standards that reflect readiness for college and careers, and the common core is one way to get there. But the philosophy is if you, if you have a much higher standard and are honest with kids and communities and parents about where kids are against this higher standard, then there should be a few areas of very important focus and prioritization, but a lot more flexibility uh, on how you get there. So, Phil, you wanted to talk about the waivers and no child. Well, I, I want to talk about something else first, which uh, John brought up, the uh, Pell Grants, which uh, uh, again, use that as an example of uh, investment. But I, I would say, honestly, that there's $56 billion of deficit that we haven't figured out how to fund Pell Grant yet, so we're giving more money to more kids, but uh, are accumulating at least over the next several years uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars of unpaid liability. Um, um, we, we absolutely uh, adhere to the Pell Grants. We like the Pell Grants. We think uh, they belong in American education, but they need to be radically fixed. Uh, I might add that um, in the Pell Grant, which um, is uh, being, can be used for many different educational choices. It would be interesting to note that in K-12, we don't use Title I or IDA money for choice, and we think we should. And that, I'll talk about waivers in, in just a minute. So well, do you want to respond? respond. going to do higher ed a little later, but that's okay. Go ahead. Well, just a quick response on um, Phil's critique of the increase in Pell funding, and um, that that's you know money that in the end may get you know re re increase the deficit. Um, so again, here's what I'd say: when people in this audience and in Washington D.C. and people watching this online and people in the country look at the two candidates in education, there are genuinely major differences in the philosophy about what should happen on education. Major, decent people, major differences in what should happen, and this to me is a great one and an important one. So the critique that increasing Pell Grants would increase the deficit, I think education is a very small part of the overall deficit and over the overall budget in the country. The president said it has to be an area we increase modestly in order to invest in and produce better outcomes. So increasing Pell Grants to help go from 6 million to 10 million students benefit from Pell Grants, which is huge. Today, 10 million students right now are benefiting from Pell Grants, low-income students. That's not just an investment in the students. We know from the data that 40 years ago, a high school degree was the minimal ticket to a middle class job. Today, a college degree of some kind is. And the wage gap and the unemployment rates, are huge gaps between those at the post-secondary education and those not. Our investment in those Pell Grants and low-income students going to college mm -hmm. fuels our long-term economy. And that's not uh, adding to our economic problem. Um, it's actually adding to our economic solutions. So I'm going to get back to higher ed affordability, but I'm still curious about No Child Left Behind. Right. What would happen in a Romney administration? Um, we've laid out in our uh, white paper um, the criteria for our uh, thoughts about reauthorization. Uh, we put forward a, 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 a reasonably uh, provocative um, recommendation about Title I. There, there are basically in K-12 two kinds of money that come from the federal government to K-12 education. That's the 10% we've referred to several times here tonight, and that's Title I money and IDEA money for special needs children. And we, um, we have recommended that that money, like Pell Grants, should be given directly to the children. Again, under the philosophy that no child who's uh, 
been born into a zip code should be obligated to necessarily go to a specific school. And so, and we've also said in, uh, in Title II money, which is also part of the uh, No Child Left Behind, that Title II money, which is about two and a half billion dollars, should be block granted to the states to be used the way states want to use for professional development and it's primarily for teacher training and, and professional development. And we've said that, um, along with the federal government's first philosophy that I articulated earlier, that we should uh, have a database and we should have data that empowers parents and, and um, gives them a real choice. So charter schools should, uh, uh, should be empowered, should be funded. Um, and so there's a, uh, we think that these waivers that are, be given, are being given in lieu of reauthorization if anybody hasn't seen a waiver, it's not about flexibility. Um, read one, there are 33 of them, 11 other states have applied, so there's arguably 44 states that are gonna uh, have waivers. They're very prescriptive. And uh, we think that they have led to a very unfortunate result, which is just starting to play out right now where we've uh, given states the ability to set their own account accountability standards the law today prescribes proficiency for all students in the year 2012. And these waivers have given uh, the states the right to set their own accountability standards. It's been evidenced uh, in the last several weeks, actually, it's a very topical subject. So many of these states are setting different accountability standards for different constituencies of children. So we're actually racially defining proficiency over the next seven years as a result of waivers that are being given by the federal government. I think it's wrong. It's right back to where we began in terms of the soft bigotry of the low expectations. And what would Governor Romney do about that? We would reauthorize No Child Left Behind. And, and, and by the way, as it relates to waivers, there are, there are presidential orders or executive orders, essentially. And um, I, I think in a Romney administration, we'd review all executive orders. and and uh, determine whether they made sense or not. So to clarify, states would be responsible for a common high standard, but the money would go to individuals to choose either charters or private schools or public other schools. public schools. Where, where, where the law applied. So there are certain states, there are about seven or eight states, where private schools are part of um, the choice program, and the uh, Title I money would be allowed to be used for that, or for charters, or for uh, online education or for uh, schools um, out, outside of district, inside your district, uh, depending on availability, that it's giving the parent the choice with their own money to decide where to send their child to school. Most of us in this room have that choice today. Why shouldn't everybody have that choice? Do you want to respond, John? There's one, on the, one question, on, if, I, if, I can, if I can. The problem you're describing of states setting their own goals and different goals with different goals for different subgroups on education, what would a, a Rom, what's, what, what in the Romney plan would address that? What would the Rom, Romney administration do to address that, what you're describing as a problem? We'd, go, we would, um, we'd have to see what no child looked like, but if it looked like the no child left behind that is still the law, that the Obama administration is averting with rate waivers, we'd, we'd go back to some semblance of the law and set the same standard for all children. And that's, by the way, in Florida, which arguably has been since 1998 the most significant increase in um, the decrease, it has decreased the achievement gap the most significantly uh, of any state in America. And I would contend that a large part of that is that we had one standard for all children, English learners, special needs kids, didn't matter. And as a consequence, we've seen the achievement gap narrow to almost nothing. And our, um, our African-American kids today score in the, if they were a state, they'd be the, they'd be the 30th state in the, beating California and many other states. So, one standard for all kids, which was no child left behind initially, and we hope we would return to that. So we agree on some, some, and there's some issues that would be addressed in terms of um, the president deeply focused on equity and moving all kids from all backgrounds toward high standards. I must say, though, I feel what you're saying, I think, falls into the trap of some of the worst parts of no child left behind. 
um, I think that what happened under No Child Behind, which again had some real good done to it, done, done by No Child Behind, there was some real damage too. I think one damage was that there were very prescriptive requirements for how states had to carry out their accountability systems and to carry out the implementation of No Child Behind through very prescriptive regulations, that in the end, in order to comply with all those and for the states to sort of do, look like they were doing well on all those and not have schools that were declared low performing, it, the states were then incented to lower the standard and they set a lower standard with the kind of fill in the bubble, multiple choice test reflecting that lower standard in order to meet that prescriptive kind of approach. And what the president's approach has been, and Arnie Duncan's approach has been, is let's flip that, let's be tight on the goals and have really high rigorous goals where standards reflecting readiness for college and careers and actually require that in some way. Common Core or states could set their own as long as they were certified to reflect real readiness for college and careers and give more flexibility. Now, there has got to be a focus on accountability too, but I think what you're describing could get us back to the prescription and then states lowering their standards instead of requiring a high standard and giving more flexibility to get there. Let me just follow up on the choice part of uh, Phil's answer previously using Title I and IDEA um, as uh, essentially vouchers, right, to students to choose their school. So uh, pr President Obama has uh, um, championed um, um, parental choice um, in public Except education. In the DC scholarship um, program. He's, he's championed parental uh, choice in public education as part of a broader package. I think he sees the evidence shows that parental choice is important if it's done along with actually investing funding and ensuring accountability to give kids opportunities for better choices in their neighborhood and better choices in their community. So as part of a package, it's good. My concerns with the Romney proposal, um, three concerns. One is, is that if you really focus mostly, and Phil began this debate, this debate saying the real focus for the federal government is, is transparency and choice. If you focus just on those things and you're willing to walk away from some of the funding that's needed to actually help schools improve, I think choices aren't meaningful. I think if you walk, as, walk away from the accountability requirements, um, one of the pieces of the Romney proposal, again, with all due respect to Phil, but is it would eliminate the requirement, as I understand it, for schools that are low performing to take action um, in order in, the, in pursuit of more flexibility. I think that if you have choice without the accountability and the, the funding, it's not real. The second concern I've got about the choice proposal is that um, I think it's not very, I think it's an interesting idea that doesn't seem um, workable in a significant way at scale. I think that if you say to a, a low income kid in a Title I school, um, in, um, in the Bronx, um, that you can yet take $700 in Title I funding and have that go toward a school in the suburbs, but you don't have transportation to get there. I think $700 in Title I funding doesn't, and without transportation, with suburban schools that often don't have spaces anyway, I just don't think, although I, can't sense, I think there are ways of trying to do it in a small way, but to try to mandate that on the country where you would say 50 states would need to in order to get Title I funds, have to do that and use their state funds to do that, I think is taking an interesting idea and going, going too far and not providing the local choice that families need in their own communities. So to, once again, to clarify, <laughs> does the proposal for um, the vouchers include state and local funds coming along with the Title I or there, IDEA funds? Uh, let, me, let me just start by, I, I think it's sort of the, uh, at the deepest philosophical level, it's the sort of ultimate hypocrisy to send your kids to private school and then veto DC scholarship program. That, that's not right. I mean, those poor kids should have the same right that we have to send our kids to whatever they want. And so the DC scholarship program has been uh, opposed by this administration for the three years it's been in office and it's a travesty. They should, those, those kids should be allowed to go wherever they want. That's the ultimate choice. The, um, so, what we've said is that Title I money goes with states can match. There are seven or eight states today that would probably do that, and probably more if Title I money, which is could be, John says 700, but it's probably closer. In some places, it's closer to $2,000 per uh, student. Um, you know, and so it would actually have a real impact on on, uh, we think, that states either matching it or putting state funding with it. and really driving choice. Parents, students should have choice about where they go to school. And uh, we, think, uh, we think that um, if you look at all these low performing schools 10 years ago, five years ago, four years ago, unfortunately, sadly, they're still the same schools. We haven't done anything about it. We thought 
we think that there needs to be some disruption in the system, and uh, we believe that uh, choice and giving parents the ability to send their children where they want is part of that disruption. One last quick comment. Yes. Um, so I think the question is, what is an effective disruption, as you put it, in order to give families a choice of better schools in, 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 the, in their community? And to me, um, the seven hundred dollars, or the average, you know, eight nine hundred dollars. There may be a few places it's two thousand, but it's generally under a thousand dollars. If you have pride in that amount and suggesting that that's going to give the families a meaningful choice to go to a school elsewhere, mm -hmm. I just think isn't 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 real. Again, I think there are interesting ways to take the proposal and designed and try some things out, but I don't think it's designed well enough to mandate that 50 states do it. Whereas I think the disruption the president has talked about and proposed and actually has been, and Arnie Duncan and Secretary have been, have been executing on, is uh, to require that low achieving schools take really dramatic steps to turn around and improve. And uh, the, you know, many people are familiar with the Title I school improvement grants that have really set most, uh, helped lots of low-performing schools around the country begin to make very significant change um, in terms of the teacher, teaching quality and the curricula and the support decided at the local level with funding and accountability requirements to support that. I think ultimately, get, reforming existing schools and expanding access to public charter schools give better chance of getting real choices in a child and family's community than a $700 or $100,000 to support going to a suburban school. One last the, title. Dr. Barrow, I would yeah. say is that uh, the federal government has a limited role in federal in public education. It's primarily Title I and IDA money. It may not uh, be, it, we think it will be the significant catalyst to get this choice effort started. It may, may not have all of the characteristics that uh, we, we would need in terms of total student funding, but the federal government's role should be to get this choice started. One more Title I or No Child Left Behind question that has to do with the prevalence of testing. I know you've talked about new kinds of tests, but in this city we have a growing parental backlash against testing. Uh, we read every day about uh, some new scandal involving testing. What are your proposals about standardized tests? About stopping scandals? Standardized tests, <laughs> yes, <laughs> not scandals. Well, certainly testing is uh, uh, taken on a, a, a bad brand name for sure, and it's, it's happened in Florida, it's happened not only here in New York, but around the country. Uh, but um, unfortunately, that's what we have to do to assess, properly assess students. And uh, uh, it's gonna be an interesting political dilemma whether politicians, these 46 governors who have signed up for Common Core and who have signed up for new assessments are going to have the uh, political courage to uh, actually implement them. And it's, this next couple of years will be a very, very interesting time to see whether that happens or not. Okay. So look, um, mediocre tests are a problem and, um, and a need to be um, uh, replaced, in, in, in my view, and I think the pre with the president's um, leadership can be replaced by much better assessments that measure the kind of things that we really care about our kids learning. It's not just filling in a bubble in a multiple choice test. I think one of the problems with the No Child Left Behind Act is it required this kind of testing, but then didn't provide the funding to actually even implement and design better tests. So you often had to sort of dumb down the kind of tests that were available. And I think that's a problem. It's created real backlash. So that's got to be addressed with much better assessments that are useful in giving information to students and families and teachers to help figure out how to improve how kids are doing. I think every school we've seen that's made progress and dramatic progress has had good assessments with useful information that helps people make improvements. And I think the design and the use of assessments in a good way is important. But at the same time, the bigger problem is not tests. And I think there are the backlash is understandable, but it has to be addressed through better assessments. But the real backlash should not be against tests, even though they should be addressed and replaced with better assessments. The real backlash should be against the fact that in this country, we are nowhere where we need to be in education in terms of actual performance. We once were number one in the world in educational performance 40 years ago. The US has slipped to number 14, 16, 22. And it's not because we've gotten worse. We've just got not gotten better, or a little bit better. And the demands on our kids have gone way up in order to get good jobs and participate successfully in an information-driven society. And so the real question is how do we actually stop the stagnation or slight incremental improvements we've had and make much bigger progress? And I think that's the big fight, even though we have to address the assessment issue in an effective way along the way. Did you want to say anything in response? No, I, I think that states need to take a much more uh, offensive marketing role in this and stop playing defense, I think there's a, 
Um, I, I agree with John that we need to enhance our assess assessments. And under Common Core, uh, assessments are going to get more prevalent rather than less prevalent and more, hopefully more meaningful. Um, for example, uh, we're going to have to find uh, uh, secure online devices to be able to, to start taking uh, tests uh, in a more realistic way than sitting down at a desk. And uh, the funding for that from the state point of view will be significant, but needs to be made. Let me move on to teachers and teaching. Uh, recent research shows that the teaching force is becoming younger and younger. The term being used is the greening of the teaching force, and that more teachers are leaving within their first five years than ever before. Um, right now, the modal years of experience in the teaching force is one. What do you think your candidate would do to uh, support teaching and the teaching profession so we can stop this leaky, bu leaky bucket? Well, um, um, to discuss this at uh, Teachers College obviously is uh, very relevant. Uh, um, in Florida, we ha we, um, uh, because our pop teacher population has uh, grown older and people have retired and gone out of the system, we hire uh, approximately 20,000 teachers a year. Um, the schools of education turn out 6,000, of which 3,000 uh, end up teaching in our public schools in Florida. Uh, and yet, we call everybody other than the 3,000 alternatively certified. So the first thing we need to do is, uh, I think, take a whole new approach to the constraints about how people, very capable people, can come into the teaching workforce and we think that um, there's a much different approach. For example, I mentioned Title II money in, uh, in IDA should be given in a block grant to the states and let them begin to open the pathways for people from all kinds of walks of life to be teachers, well-qualified teachers. We're recommended, by the way, in terms of the IDEA um, reauthorization, we would take out highly qualified is a prerequisite. We think it uh, develops some constraints to getting like TFA into the, the classroom. So there's, the evidence is pretty clear that the, the number one in-school factor, as you note, mm -hmm. Susan, driving improved student success is the quality of teaching in the school. Sometimes that gets misinterpreted to mean that if just a teacher just works harder, and just tries harder and does better, that somehow that's gonna like solve everything. When in fact, I think that what the president's approach has been, we actually need a systematic focus on how do you attract, retain, develop, so we can have teachers at all levels really excel, tapping the, the research base that's been developed across the country, including here, um, to understand how kids learn and how to succeed. So the president's had a three-part plan on teaching quality, um, and would build on that in a second term in a significant way. Number one is to um, give on an opt-in basis um, opportunity for school systems across the country to really truly professionalize teaching, to create a um, career ladders that would give opportunities for people to um, who are successful advance into having roles where they could be lead teachers, support other teachers' success, become instructional coaches, to really redesign the whole way that a teacher kind of goes through a career where you know today most people, most jobs and sectors don't you know spend 30 years in one position. Um, people can, should be able to do that. But part of the, the, the reformed teacher incentive fund program that uh, has just given grants across the program, which used to be more about performance pay, has the president's broadened that and said, how do you really make teaching and school leadership a, a performance-based career where you can kind of grow and develop in lots of roles? And a teacher evaluation system is a, is a component of that. The second thing the president's doing um, is uh, trying to, has been supporting the reform of preparation of teachers um, in the first place. And there have been support for programs, including teacher residency programs, um, where teachers get year-long residencies to prepare to become teachers based in part on what the president, a model the president knew very well in Chicago, and he's visited a number of times before he was president, the Academy for Urban School Leadership in Chicago, where teachers are um, very carefully recruited and selected, spend a year in residency working with master teachers selected for that purpose, have really rigorous training in a partnership with the local university, and then go in cohorts of teachers into schools to improve low achieving schools. And that model has created a lot of great teachers and had great results in actually being disruptive and improving low performing schools. So expanding that kind of model in teacher preparation. And the third thing the president's been focused on, and Secretary Duncan have been focused on and, and will be, is how do you provide more incentives 
um, for people to go into teaching and reduce the, um, student, the student loan debt and the financial obligation that people take to go into teaching. And there's been some significant strides in making it easier to get loan forgiveness, paying off loans for people who go into and stay teaching for several years. So one hypothesis about why many more teachers are leaving than before is the accountability system, some of which you referenced, specifically with respect to teachers. The use of standardized test scores in teacher evaluation, for example. Um, what, is, what do you think your candidate's position is on um, that, the use of those tests to evaluate teachers and to uh, attach consequences to them? So um, the President and, and Arne Duncan, his secretary, have been clear that we have to help develop teachers and give them the capacity to succeed. In order to develop teachers, as good as kind of one-shot occasional professional development can be designed, the way you really help teachers succeed is through ongoing significant feedback from skilled leaders, principals, and instruction leaders to help them improve. And in most careers, you have as a basis for that teacher evaluation or performance evaluation systems that gives data to managers and employees on saying, here's how we're doing and here's the information we need to give feedback. So and the president and the secretary and the administration have seen teacher evaluations as a part of a way to give feedback that's needed to help teachers improve and also to see which teachers are, are doing well to give them a chance to take on other roles. And yes, that when in a fairly designed system, if there are teachers that are not doing well, and have support after they've been identified as low performing, that there actually are mechanisms for ensuring that those teachers are not in front of kids, whether counseled out or dismissed. And that's not anywhere near the majority of teachers. It's a small subset. But tackling that problem in some ways, along with supporting the development of the vast majority of teachers who can succeed, uh, the president thinks it's a better way to offer better choices for kids than many other strategies. In terms of the test score question, the president and the secretary have been clear that the improved achievement of kids should be one among multiple measures in a teacher evaluation system. And they think that an evaluation that doesn't include a look at whether kids are improving isn't really serious about helping people understand what the kids are learning. A system that only looks at that um, is missing very important feedback around how teachers are doing against rubrics around professional practice, around improvement. So it's really got to be a blend of multiple measures. And that's been the president and the secretary's policy. And I think it'll continue to be. So? Um, we, we agree, obviously, on the importance of the teacher as the, the most significant uh, characteristic in the classroom. Um, we don't think it's the role of the federal government to be mandating these kind of evaluations of teachers. We happen to agree with them, but we don't think they should be mandated either by waivers or by federal prescription. Okay, let's move on to the higher education uh, issue that I said I'd return to. So we started a conversation on affordability, uh, talking about Pell, but that also has to do with student loans and indebtedness, and I'd like your uh, sense of what, how your candidates would address the growing issue of student debt uh, and making college more affordable to more students. John, you want to start? Or? Um, sure. Okay. Um, so, uh, unless you would like to, Phil. No, you're in the incumbent. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, on all of these issues, I think one of the things the president, from the first time I got to know him, recognized in the scene is there are examples of success across this country, whether it's pre K programs that are preparing kids for success in, in kindergarten, K through 12 public schools are succeeding, or post secondary institutions that are doing really well in improving how the kids are doing, students are doing, completing college, you know, managing costs. And so I think that the successes in some ways have informed um, the president's policies, as well as the urgent need for investing in post-secondary education, college affordability for students. So specifically, um, the president has, in addition to, I mentioned the Pell Grants, and we have 10 million students on Pell Grants, and there's a big focus. But the, um, the uh, um, reform of the student loan program um, that the president championed um, successfully, didn't get everything he wanted, um, but got a lot. Um, was very significant in essentially moving the student loan program to a now a, um, a direct loan program fully, and the 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 benefits of that there was there were about uh, eighty billion dollars, seventy or eighty billion dollars, um, approximately that were saved in the shift from kind of essentially the subsidies for the banks for those loan programs to actually being available to help support students. And there were three ways in which the say that six seventy to eighty billion dollars were used. One is it increased Pell Grants and helped us get to the 10 million students benefiting from Pell Grants today. Number two is it, it enabled a big investment in community colleges, 
um, which is, are a very important part of training workers for kind of high-skilled jobs in this economy. And third is it enabled, uh, and I think this hasn't gotten enough attention, but a really significant um, uh, enabling of an income-based repayment plan that is um, still moving fully into effect where soon a uh, student will be able to essentially pay only 10% um, of their discretionary income um, and would not, won't have to pay more than that, and then that can be paid, essentially be forgiven after 20 years to make the student loan debt more manageable. And that investment in student loans is um, kind of representative of the kind of approach student now. Um, costs uh, in post-secondary post education are a significant issue. Interesting, last four years, that for students overall, that net costs have actually not gone up because of the president's policies, that the investments in loans and Pell Grants have actually been more than the increase in um, um, tuition costs. Moving forward, the president has proposed a really significant race to the top for post-secondary education that would incent post-secondary institutions and states to both um, measure and improve their ability to complete students in college, to get students all the way to complete college, because we've got a big college dropout problem that doesn't get talked about enough, and to help incent those places that would actually manage their costs better in order to make sure we don't have um, the continued rising costs we have. So this will continue to be a major focus for the president uh, in a second term. So. Well, student debt, is, uh, as most of you know, has become a, a trillion dollar uh, portfolio, more than all consumer debt uh, put together. So it's a very large I issue. And um, um, I w would say that uh, starting to forgive student debt is sort of like a creeping entitlement. We're about to uh, begin uh, giving people the ability not to pay back their debts in, in the student area. There, there's a lot of things that can be done that, that haven't been done by this administration. For example, <clears throat> their attitude toward for-profit education has been very negative. And um, I think, uh, again, if you read our white paper, that would uh, um, recommend that we do away with what's called the 90-10 rule and the gainful employment rule, both of which are driving up tuition, as is higher Pell Grants actually dr driving up tuition, probably, as opposed to um, uh, what I said before, we're, we're creating huge debts at the federal level and huge debts at the student level. Uh, John has uh, suggested that the student loan program has been monopolized um, at the federal government level and private lenders have been taken out of the industry. Um, we, we would recommend that, um, again, given our attitude toward competition, that, the, that private lenders be allowed back into the industry. We think we'd uh, see more competition, we'd see more efficiency, we'd see more choice for, uh, for students in the process. Uh, I think there's several other um, uh, areas of higher education which need to be um, talked about, like, like uh, uh, workplace development. Um, our recommendation is that, uh, again, not surprisingly, we would recommend that the over $20 billion a year in 47 programs that don't really produce a, a a product don't really produce jobs should be given directly to the uh, recipients and let them use that the way they want for to get job training as opposed to uh, give it to the federal government and let them administrate it. So generally there's much more, uh, I would say, choice that should be given to kids and their parents. Um, the same transparency, truth, data collection uh, needs to be uh, uh, evident in higher education, as we suggest it should be in K-12 as well. So the hope is that um, we would have data sets and not have to rely on U U.S. News and World Report, but um, obviously have a much more effective information uh, technique for giving kids a choice, a proper choice. I think choice among unaffordable loans is not a real choice. I mean, if I may, I wonder what would um, what would Governor Romney do in order to? I mean, it's a really an issue in terms of college debt in order to promote um, college affordability. Um, the one thing we do with Pell Grants, for example, is have a completion uh, requirement. So, um, for example, uh, in Florida, we have Florida Virtual Schools. Florida Virtual School offers a course and gets paid at the end of the course when the when the a student is proficient in that course. And that should be the same with, with uh, federal programs which uh, allow children to go to, kids to go to school, not complete school, but still get the money, not complete the course, but still get the money. There's a much more rigorous criteria that should be, I think, administered 
uh, as it relates to giving out federal money for uh, going to school and not, not completing a course or completing a program. I think that, you know, I hear you mentioned the, um, the return, one policy you mentioned was returning the um, loan program to the, um, not being direct loan, but to the, to the banks. And you know, that, was, um, that, there was, that was done for a while, and uh, the switch, of course, has been now made to the direct loan program. Um, and there are still private um, companies and banks participating in that. It's just they're as contractors now to the federal government as opposed to kind of getting the subsidies to the banks in order to be the originators of the loans. There is a market role for that. The, um, the question, though, I have is kind of, uh, if you did that, what would you do to replace the funding that actually has made possible the Pell Grants, the investment in community colleges, the income-based repayment? I mean, to me, if you have a responsible income-based repayment plan, um, it's been paid for by the elimination of the subsidies to the banks as middlemen. That's not um, contributing to the student debt problem, it's helping it by making the debt, the debt more manageable. And I just think Pell Grants in, increasing them, I think it's, it's just such a priority. I have to say, my wife, Elisa, is here in the front row, with, um, and um, so glad that she's here. She went to college with help from a Pell Grant. Um, uh, and I think there are so millions of people in the country who wouldn't have the chance to go without Pell. And I think finding ways to both reform Pell, but also improve access to it for millions of kids is just crucial. I guess what we would say is that the reform is essential. So building a $56 billion deficit from Pell Grants is not acceptable. Well, the, um, uh, the Romney and Ryan budgets um, would double or triple the shortfall to 100 or $150 billion. And so the question is, where does the funding come from to pay for it? And my concern about the Romney budget overall is when you have to cut um, discretionary and domestic funding by over 50%, you don't have funding to be able to address shortfalls like that, whereas the president has laid out some of these clear steps because of his investment in education to help address the shortfall. So certainly poverty, um, living in violence, health conditions, safe neighborhoods are all critical to success uh, throughout students' lives. What would your candidates say about the non-school factors and um, the role of po federal policy in addressing them? It's a, it's a much broader issue. I, I think that as it relates to the school system, this is what we're focused on in terms of our policy. I mean, the, there's a great many social programs that obviously go into that. And, but what we've learned over the years, whether it be in Harlem or Bronx or Miami or Jacksonville, that all children can learn regardless of their, it would be, it'd be fantastic to improve home life and to improve social environments. But we have learned that kids can learn and we should assume that they can learn and, uh, and I think behave accordingly. So I think the um, evidence shows that kids, including kids in poverty, when they have access to high quality expectations and support and instruction, can make dramatic progress in a way that many people um, don't believe. But the evidence is clear. We've had way too low expectations for our kids, especially kids from low income backgrounds, kids of color, kids who've been underserved, and we've had too low expectations of all kids. So part of the overall arching part of the president is how do you support state and community efforts to raise those expectations and support kids um, and teachers' ability to uh, achieve those expectations. The evidence also shows is that um, schools are not everything. Um, I think some people would suggest you, can't, you shouldn't tackle school reform until you fix poverty. I think we'll never get to that unless we support schools. Other people would suggest you only focus on schools without focusing on other issues, including nutrition and counseling and social services and health care. And for kids who live, people in this audience, people who live in, kids live in poverty, they can succeed, but there are a lot of barriers that have to be addressed both academically and non-academically in order to support that. Some of the most successful models we've seen support that. I see Pam Cantor here tonight um, from Turn On Schools. This is a great example of how you combine the work in schools. Um, so I think that the president has um, supported that with um, funding to support efforts like the Harlem Children's Zone across the country. That's been very important. And I think the president's budget priorities, he has proposed a, four trillion, a, way, to, you know, to, a way to deal with $4, four trillion in cuts to be fiscally responsible. But, but to cut discretionary domestic spending by over 50% over time, including for things like um, social welfare programs and health programs and nutritional programs and education programs, I think just doesn't allow you to make that progress, which is why I said we've got to be responsible. But we've got to make sure we invest both in schools and not out of school issues to help our kids, especially kids in poverty, succeed. 
So I'm going to now ask you the most popular question. It was suggested by every segment uh, in the faculty, our community here, and uh, our friends in Washington, and that is, what are the candidate stances on early childhood education? Phil, so we'll start with you. Uh, well, we have uh, the primary uh, federal role in, uh, uh, in uh, early childhood education is Head Start. And we think, uh, again, as part of our proposal, that um, <clears throat> the Head Start should have different criteria and different e elements of success. Um, it's allowed to be, it, it has been allowed to go on for decades, uh, not as an academic experience, uh, unfortunately, but um, much more um, uh, as a social experience, not as a not preparing children for school, which we think early childhood education. We have started in Florida uh, uh, preschool education funded by the state, and the, we think that's a very legitimate. There's a lot of states that have started uh, what they call uh, pre-kindergarten, and we think that's uh, an important part, but not an important part for, uh, federal, for federal participation unless there's real criteria associated with it. And, and at the federal level? Um, um, the, um, I was going to ask a question, but I guess I, I'll, I'll, I'll wait to that. The, um, um, so I was, having seen the president from when he was senator, I'd say there is nothing that he is more passionate about um, in education um, and maybe beyond in terms of domestic policy than investment in quality early learning um, for young kids. Uh, in the 2008 debates, I remember he was asked education, um, none of the moderators asked questions about debates, but in each debate he responded uh, with answers about education. He was asked about what, what, what's something he would do to invest in our long-term economic growth, and he said that we got to invest in early learning. So when the stimulus came along, he insisted on making sure that there was, in fact, um, investments in expanded Head Start programs. Um, uh, but the key is not only investing more funding, He's also, like other parts of his education agenda, says, look, we can't, we gotta make much better use of existing funding. And so the administration has implemented um, uh, regulations of a law that was passed with bipartisan support a couple years before, but in a very aggressive way to reform Head Start by actually ending contracts with low-performing Head Start programs and actually giving more contracts to those Head Start programs that are really demonstrating results serving young kids. And to me, this is a great example of his philosophy, which is some people would say you need more funding, but when things aren't working, you just keep more funding going. Some people would say, yeah, kind of ignore that and maybe reform things, but you don't, you don't add funding, and that, that doesn't um, really expand access. And the president's approach has been, how do you both invest and make dramatic changes in the way the programs are working? I think you'll see, in the, and also in this first term, he had a very large um, early learning proposal that was um, as part of this um, uh, SAFRA Act that was uh, basically trying to apply the savings from the student loan program and at the last moment in Congress uh, things were taken, uh, investment in early learning was taken out which was a real disappointment but he's had an early learning race the top challenge which states across the country, Democratic or Republican states, have come together and applied for funding for how they redesign the early learning systems and I just think you're going to continue to see in a second Obama term a major focus on how do we really expand not just the quantity but the quality of access to quality, early learning. So this goes beyond Head Start and beyond three and four year olds, but it's beyond disadvantaged uh, kids. Yeah, so it's, um, I mean, he's, he's very focused on the needs from kids from zero to five. And how do you support creation of systems that include Head Start, that include um, child care, quality child care, that include state um, 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 programs. And the early learning race at the top was a comp competition that gave funding to states to actually help design. How do you stitch together in a way, building on Governor Hunt, uh, who's really in North Carolina, created the Smart Start program, which is one model um, for how do you how you stitch together these programs for kids really from birth to five. And he's focused both on Head Start and three and four year olds, but really looking at how to support state and community efforts to help kids all the way to get ready for success in kindergarten. If you don't do that, you can catch up with kids for sure, but it's much harder and it's much more expensive. So he thinks that both the outcome gains you'll get, but actually the cost savings you'll get by doing a good job on the front end are huge. And Phil, just to be clear, you pretty much confined your remarks to Head Start as for the federal yeah, role. Uh, I, I know it won't be popular in this audience, but um, you just can't keep adding to the deficit. And uh, you can create all these programs, but uh, we don't think it's an appropriate role for the federal government to keep adding to these programs. I think it's true. I mean, the question is, you get, as a president, you get to make a few priorities about what are the things you focus on? What are the things that you lead on? 
We need to make sure when push comes to shove, when all the political squabbling ends, what are the things that you're really going to make sure get done? And I think the choice that the um, country has in, between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney it includes that Barack Obama, at the end of the day, year after year, is going to make a major focus on supporting kids from a young age through K through 12 through college affordability and doesn't regard those as just a set of these programs. There are other cuts that are needed. There's differences over tax it takes taxation for the wealthy. But I do think you see a legitimate difference of philosophy about whether you prioritize education as president, both investments and reform, that I think, in my view, if we make the right choice to do that, the consequences will not only be so huge for kids' access to opportunity in this country, but it'll drive good jobs or economic competitiveness, not by itself, but it'll help. I think if we don't make that one of the few priorities, and if it's just a set of these programs that, uh, that may not get cut or may get cut or may get increased a little bit but aren't a huge focus, I think it's not the right choice for the country. Well, I would say that uh, Governor Romney, having been the governor of Massachusetts, as we learned that the, in the last debate with an 87% Democratic uh, legislature, made education a very high priority in his administration in Massachusetts. They finished uh, with the highest standards, with uh, the highest NAEP scores under his tutelage as governor. He believes in uh, education, uh, proved that he did, and couldn't get a bipartisan support for doing that. Uh, but that doesn't mean including uh, increasing the federal de deficit in the process. He built very, and there was a lot of progress over time in Massachusetts that made Massachusetts very successful, and the governor um, maintained that. Um, and even did a couple things to try to build on that, and some didn't pass, and some got passed, some didn't get passed. That leads me to say, I might vote for Mitt Romney for governor. <laughs> but I don't think that that's the basis for electing him for pre to be president on education. I'm wondering if you're giving your closing statement a little prematurely. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, certainly I certainly a, felt like it. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question from the Education Week audience. Um, the arts and humanities, they've always been such an important part of our, uh, our education and our lives as um, productive citizens and uh, uh, as citizens who enjoy life. So how can we preserve them at a time when they, are, they tend to be the first things cut? So um, uh, part of the introduction, which um, uh, was not included, was my I, role, I served as the vice uh, chairman of the Institute of Educational Sciences, which is the research arm of the Department of Education, which uh, focuses on uh, education research. And I will say, um, over the last 10 years, we've significantly enhanced the quality of uh, educational research and brought it far from where it should be, but brought it to a level um, of credibility that heretofore it didn't exist. But uh, to your question, there has been a myth about uh, courses in that um, uh, in the last 10 years that we've actually decreased math, I mean music, arts and uh, other social sciences, the actual data would indicate that we haven't done that. So um, we've actually uh, maintained our level of continuing education in the arts and, and other social studies and history at a time when we focused, tried to focus more importantly on reading and, uh, and uh, math. But um, I, I don't believe that that's a crisis that needs to be folk, that needs to be cured. I think it's actually, uh, in terms of arts education, probably have a status quo versus ten or five years ago. So part of the um, president and the administration's ESEA reauthorization is to um, provide support for kind of a well-rounded education um, for arts and for for music and. Um, and, and look, I, I see it on our, on our own kids and kids in schools. I visit in the country, the arts can done right, play such a role in helping spark kids' curiosity, get kids to school. Um, I think the, um, uh, the uh, and the data I think Phil's right, actually I think is, um, shows that there hasn't been the significant um, 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 pullback on those programs nationally that sometimes people um, suggest. At the same time, I think the question is how do we, uh, as a country, invest deeply in kids, especially who are behind, their ability to read well, to write well, to do math, and yeah, to have uh, the arts and, and music programs as well. Um, and I think this is a classic um, example of 
a both and, which really is getting solved by places, especially for the highest poverty communities, in places that wind up having longer school days and longer school years, um, and saying, look, you know what, if kids are behind, that they may need more time um, in a school day and more time in a school year, so that they do get fo focused. They need the focus on reading and literacy and math and the science. They need the arts and the music. You can't do that in a shorter day. And again, that does require um, some cost, but if you do it right in a responsible way, in a targeted way where it's needed most, it can be done in a way that sort of pays off and reduces our costs as a society over time. So let me ask about education research since you brought it up. So this is the privilege of the chair. Uh, the investment in education research is less than the investment in any other sector, and that includes private sources as well as the federal government. You cited um, the federal role in data collection and research as one of its most important roles. So would you support enhanced funding for educational research? Yes. John? And, and Phil, Phil's demonstrated that. I mean, Phil, again, Phil is a great leader and a great person um, and a committed um, uh, advocate for education in many ways, including his role on educational research and his role in Florida. And so um, that yes is, is real. Um, um, I assume, in fact, that Ron. Thank, thank you for enhancing my answer, John. <laughs> um, I just can't stand short answers. So I have to do something about them. <laughs> it's one of my developmental needs. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, investment in research is so key. You can't really do that in a sustained way if you're cutting domestic non-defense non discretionary funding by more than 50% a year. Um, I think it's just there are so many things that can cut you, it's just very hard to do. So I, I love, I'm thrilled to hear Phil say that, but in that kind of budget policy, that and so many things are gonna be at risk, um, even if there's a, an interest in supporting them. Okay, and one final question from the DC audience has to do with whose voice is heard in education. I would put in a plug for the researchers, but other people want to know about teachers and students and how do their voices get included in education policy making? Uh, if not at the federal level, how would you encourage states and localities to include their voices? Bill? Well, um, we have 14,000 school districts and therefore 14,000 school boards. Um, it, it is um, a phenomena that school board elections are uh, ignored by parents and by um, uh, by many people in the constituent in the in the community. I would I would uh, urge folks to be much more involved in school board races where we really have a, a chance. With a, most school boards are five or seven people, uh, without much. Um, you could change the complexion of, uh, of the outcome significantly by being involved in the school board races. Most people don't pay any attention to it. And I would say that's, at the, at the fundamental level, that's where uh, most uh, policy is really made. Um, that's where contracts are negotiated. That's uh, where policy is made. That's where textbooks are done. That's where a lot of, oh, um, a lot of voices should be heard, and I'm afraid they're not. Um, so I'll not only speak for myself, but I'll tell you a little story of what I saw um, from the president before he was president that relates to your answer. And uh, I was in New Orleans, he was in New Orleans um, in 2007. Um, and my wife, Elisa, uh, and I were there. And uh, our daughter had been born at a New Orleans hospital. We were there post-Katrina. Um, and uh, uh, my son and I, who was two, went over to a school where the President Obama, Senator Obama, was visiting a New Orleans school as part of a day of service and um, give a speech there. And what he most wanted to do, and he sat in the classroom, I saw him do this, he sat with a set of students in the classroom in this New Orleans school um, and some city year core members who were helping to fix up the school. And he sat and he just asked them questions, asked them questions and listened, overstayed the amount of time he needed to stay there because he so much wanted to hear from students and city year core members in New Orleans. And I think that what he heard from them significantly informed his policy overall, including his, um, his views about New Orleans over time. And I do think that students have the most profound insights about education, and we need to do much more to leverage those. I think the president has demonstrated that personally. Uh, I also think that, and there are some efforts to try this out, I think that incorporating, you talked about teacher evaluations, for example. There's some research that some of you are familiar with that shows that if you ask students the right questions, 
that is one measure, not the only measure, not the majority measure, but is one measure in a teacher evaluation to, to ask students like questions like, you know, do I, um, that relate to the teacher's sense of expectations for the student. If the student's not getting something right, does the teacher help them? That asking the right questions to students can actually be a very important part of giving teachers evaluation and feedback as part of their evaluation systems too. Okay, now it's time for your closing statements. <laughs> and, we're, and since uh, we started with uh, the question for Phil first, we're gonna let you go first this time, John. So, I think I'll start, I'll end with what I, I started with in, in a way. The um, debates about any policy issues can wind up getting to lots of important details. I think at the end of the day, when you're looking at any candidate on an issue, I think what's most crucial to look at is what are their demonstrated core beliefs and priorities over time. And then when you get into the Oval Office and there's so many things competing for your time, I think no one can imagine before they get into that situation how um, demanding your schedule is, how little time there is um, for anything you might think. And what priorities you carry with you is a fundamental conviction that need to be addressed well, ultimately and how will wind up driving your policies. Um, and when I saw um, in, again, this brink of economic catastrophe, um, President-elect Obama in early 2009, um, millions of jobs in the process of being lost, the economy in free fall, him addressing that, but taking the time to make sure that the country was gonna be investing in the long-term economic future by focusing on investing from young kids to the public schools to access to college, um, uh, and insisted on that being part of a quote, an economic stimuli, stimulus package that wouldn't work, he thought, without investing in the long term. To me, that shows the kind of priorities that he's got, and I think his policies have continued to reflect that on issue after issue tonight. I think you'll hear that gets reflected in Head Start programs and programs zero to five and investments in reform in public schools and promoting college affordability all within a fiscally responsible context. And I do think that the contrast on education, and I have respect for Mitt Romney, I have huge respect for Phil Handy, um, but I think that the view of budget policy um, that the, the governor has, and the view of the states, not only being the driver, which the president believes and is trying to give more flexibility on, but the belief that the federal government should be consolidated or shrunk a lot, and that these various issues are not for federal involvement, I do think represents a significant contrast between the two. And I think sometimes people say, hey, are Romney and Obama similar in education because um, Romney said good things about Arne Duncan and Romney said good things about Race the Top and they might, if they were in a state legislature, find some agreement on some issues. I think the question is, is not what they would do in a state. The question is what you campaign for for a president. And I think you govern typically how you campaign. And I think that the way they've campaigned and the way they've spoken about education reflects this dramatically different view. Whether you focus on education in a significant way or you don't, and the president um, will if he's reelected, and it's why I'm such an admirer of his. So. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, we'll we'll um, begin where uh, we're end where we began, which is the role of the federal government. And uh, I think we all need to be uh, mindful of the fact that there are a lot of things that we want in education. What role should the federal government play in that? And uh, we do have some fundamental disagreements about that. Um, the attempt by this administration to um, uh, go around the No Child Left Behind law by uh, uh, giving out all of these waivers, I think is a very, we view it very, very differently than they view it. Um, we think it prescribes states, restricts their flexibility, as opposed to, um, and we're seeing that played out over the last several weeks. We think the federal government should be involved in collecting data and being transparent about the data at the state level. And we think that ultimately, choice should be given to parents um, to create competition in the public school system. and. Um, that is fundamentally what we believe. I think um, this administration um, uh, believes differently in terms of their mandate to uh, make states do what they want to do. We believe that states have been the laboratory for change, have been the laboratory for reform, and will continue to be that. Um, and we have plenty of evidence, whether it be Indiana or whether it be New Orleans, 
or whether it be Florida, where a change has come about because we have reform-minded governors, not because it's being pushed by the federal government. And um, that's a very different policy, which you uh, would like to have many different programs, uh, but they should come from the states, not from the federal government. Well, I want to thank both of you so much. I don't know if our web audience can see Phil's socks. <laughs> Sort of, uh, Which uh, I just noticed, but they're bright orange. <laughs> and I'm glad that I didn't notice them earlier. I would have been completely distracted. <laughs> and you both had so I, I, I knew I didn't have that much going for me in this no, audience. No. <laughs> you both had so many interesting things to say that I'm glad that I wasn't distracted. Thank Our you comments so were much. more interesting than his socks. Thank right. you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was kind of a low bar. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, buddy.